There are also anti-electrons, anti-protons, and anti-neutrons, and other particles. But there was, that was like sort of the majority of them. And there was a heck of a lot of them. There were very, very, very many more electrons, neutrons, and protons around back then than there are now, inconceivably more. Uh, and they were uh, zooming around, bumping into each other. They were very, very hot. Gradually, things got colder. And then shortly after something, uh, the universe got a cold, something very sweet started to happen. Uh, they found, the particles found true love. Uh, the neutrons found the anti-neutrons. The protons found the anti-protons. The electrons found the anti-electrons. Every particle found its true soul mate. It was like some sort of one of those articles you see in so one of those advertisements you see in soft focus for online dating services. Um, married life was passionate, but very short. Um, the particles found each other, and then they annihilated into a hail of, of photons. And bam, bam, bam. In fact, uh, they one by one disappeared and uh, turned into just photons. So there was at one time a very, very large number of electrons, protons, neutrons in the universe. Almost all of them are gone. They're almost, they, they, this, there, there was this mass cosmic wedding, and there was somebody for everyone, except there was a very small number of lonely leftover particles that no one wanted. You can see here's an electron, here's a proton, neutron is looking around, it can't find an anti-neutron. This poor, poor proton can't find an anti-proton. This poor electron can't find its partner. Uh, and what, who are these final few lonely particles that no one wanted? And this is, I'm going to, sorry to break it to you like this, but uh, they're you. Um, because of those lonely, unwanted particles, Eventually, they gave up trying to find uh, their true soulmate, and they bound together into um, hydrogen and then more complicated things, and eventually, you guys. Um, and it's good, I guess. We can all agree that there are these sort of forlorn particles that, that weren't able to find each other. But it's, it was something of an accident, and, 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 and very much of a freak accident. There are, I mean, I, I don't even know the number, how, how many untold more particles there were back then. And it was just this tiny, tiny surplus of extra mass, what we call matter, electrons, protons, and neutrons, compared to antimatter that resulted in there being a universe around for us to see today. Um, so why was there a tiny, tiny bit more matter than antimatter? How is it that we can exist today? I think we can all, exist, all agree that this is an important question. And the answer is we don't know, um, but we're trying to understand. Um, so uh, I'm here to talk to you today about something called the electric dipole moment, and I'll explain what that is. But what does that have to do with there being a tiny bit more electron than anti-electron 14 billion years ago? Well, OK, how do we study things that happened in the past? Ideally, you'd like to have a time machine, go back in time, and like say we were interested in dinosaurs. We could go back, and with our our cameras take movies of the dinosaurs, perhaps make friends with them, whatever, uh, although they don't seem all that friendly, really. But we could study them that way. But we can't go back there. And similarly, we can't go back to the time of the Big Bang. Uh, not even, we can build very large accelerators, but they don't, when the accelerators smash together, they, they create a very, very hot cloud of particles, but not nearly as hot as what I was just talking about before. We can't, using accelerators, create conditions that were anything like the time when there was this, uh, this imbalance that was so important. Um, but we can study dinosaurs by looking at fossils. And what I want to talk about today is looking for fossils of the Big Bang. Um, and uh, so what are these fossils? And the fossils I want to talk about are, are, a, are basically tiny little asymmetries that are left over today that still exist. So symmetry is very important in nature. Here's a lovely symmetric particle. Uh, what are some of our most uh, important uh, symmetries in nature? Electrons seem to act just like anti-electrons. So do protons act like anti-protons. Neutrons seem very, very similar to anti-neutrons, as near as we can tell. Another one is that particles, electrons and other particles, when you put them in front of a mirror, you look up at them in the mirror and they look very, very similar. Like this person uh, looks at himself or herself in the mirror and thinks, well, that looks pretty much just like me in the mirror. Not everybody can do that. I know of people who, when they look at themselves in the mirror, they say, what is that weird looking guy missing a right arm? So there are particles also like particles that don't look the same in the mirror. And so in fact, in, 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 science, in nature, we find that there are tiny little uh, violations of this mirror symmetry in particles. They're usually not quite as profound as this poor, poor chap here. 
Other things are that particles look the same if you run movies backwards. Electrons, protons, they come together, they collide, and they head off. If I were to take this movie and run it backwards, <coughs> and by the way, I'm just talking about one or two particles, not a whole collection of particles. We know that if you have enough particles, entropy rears its ugly head and we have an arrow of time. But I'm talking at sort of the fundamental microscopic one or two particle level here. Electron and proton, they crash together, they bounce off. If I took a movie of this and ran the movie backwards, it would look very, very similar, but maybe not perfectly similar. These are the kind of symmetries I'm talking about. And what we discover is that uh, these symmetries tend to be good, but they're not perfect. And uh, this is sort of a clue for us. These uh, violations in these symmetries are, are fossils. Um, things look the same in the mirror. Time looks the same when you run it backwards. Matter is the same as antimatter. Um, we can create, we can, you know, theorists can construct theories that explain all about particles, and in particular, all about particles dating all the way back to the time of the Big Bang. They can create these theories, and part of when they create these theories, they can come up with versions of theories that say, yeah, there should, be, there should have been a little bit more electron than anti-electron. It makes, according to my theory, I can construct this theory where there's more protons and antiprotons a tiny bit. But it's very difficult, <coughs> all but impossible, to construct theories that predict some of these things and not other things. Theor I'm, I'm not going to get into the math, but these are connected uh, it's, and, and, uh, by, by theoretical considerations. So I guess what I want to leave for a motivation is that when we look at uh, the exist what we know about particles today, what we know about, we look at and we look and we see their various violations of, of symmetry in particles today. There isn't enough asymmetry in the particles we see today to account for our existence. It's, it's called CP violation. We look out there in experimental particle physics now, we see asymmetries in the particles, but not enough to assemble into a theory that self-consistently can predict why it was there's matter in the universe. So there, should, there need to be new experiments to discover new sources of what we call CP violation, but basically means new places, fossils, existing asymmetries that exist now that it could explain this asymmetry that was so important in the past. All right, so in our experiment, and interestingly, I do this experiment jointly with Jun Yi here. So you get sort of a double dose of Jun Yi. This, is a, this particular experiment is a two-professor experiment. In our experiment, uh, we use the uh, electron. Uh, here's Mr. Electron, charge of minus one, mass of whatever it is. It spins, therefore it's got a magnetic moment, a north pole and a south pole. Really, the, the symmetry question we want to ask are, are the North Pole and the South Pole the same? I mean, other than one's the North Pole and the South Pole uh, magnetically. Is there any other difference? They don't have to be the same. Uh, well, if we look at the North Pole and the South Pole of the Earth, we notice they're very different. The South Pole's got mountains. The North Pole is sea ice. The South Pole's got penguins. The North Pole has polar bears. Even a physicist can tell the difference between these two animals. So definitely, in the Earth, we've broken this symmetry. Uh, in the electron, we could have, in principle, a little bit, it's, it's mostly a negative particle, but there could be a, a, a electric dipole moment. You could have a little bit more positive near the North Pole and a little bit more negative near the South Pole, or vice versa, and that would be an electric dipole moment. That's what we're looking for. It is an asymmetry in the electron that violates that mirror symmetry parity I was telling you about. It also violates time running backwards symmetry I was telling you about. So if this exists, would exist, and has a certain, and if it were to have, if it were to be large enough, <coughs> it could be the fossil of the Big Bang that would go together with a lot of theoretical work to help us understand why we exist. Uh, we can think of this electric dipole moment. We can sort of add up this negative coherently with that negative. This positive sort of adds up destructively with, destructively with that. We can think of an electric dipole moment of a charged particle as just being that the center of charge is not exactly in the same place as the center of mass. Many people have tried to do this experiment. Every time they measure it, they try to measure the electric dipole moment. They find that the center of charge and the center of mass are in the same place. And so far, the current limit says if they're different from each other, if they're offset from each other, it's less than this fantastically small distance, 10 to the minus 28 centimeters. We are trying to do better yet. Uh, the level we're trying to look at would be if we had a perfectly symmetric globe uh, if we expanded the electron, sort of multiplied it, purport the electron proportionally up to the size of the globe, the kind of asymmetry in the electron we're looking at would be if you were to sort of take the northern hemisphere of the Earth 
and cover it with an extra layer of stuff, the diameter of a virus. So it's a very, very small asymmetry. The current limit is already really good. But if we could do a little better, that's kind of the level we're interested at for sort of cosmology, cosmogenesis questions, questions like where did the universe come from? Uh, we are using, we are doing this experiment using molecular ions, and you're probably wondering where I get this. The O, this is the ions conference. Am I, missed, am I correct that the O stands for optics? Yeah? Yes. So it, we're using ions, which is why I thought this would be good. Later, someone explained to me that ions doesn't mean ions. <laughs> but that the O means optics. And I'm very happy to report that we use ions, but also we use a lot of lasers, as I'll get to in a second. Uh, we use molecular ions for a reason I'll explain. Uh, OK, so our experiment's done jointly uh, with uh, me and June. Uh, we have had a number of grad students and postdocs come and go. Uh, the current ones are Matt and Jan and Will and Dan, and also an undergraduate, Ichi. And we are lavishly funded by the National Science Foundation and NIST and uh, a private foundation as well. And we have a lot of theorists who help us out on these experiments. Uh, here's a picture of some of the students. We are trying to understand this breakdown of mirror symmetry. My students are explaining to me using this thing they call the left-hand rule, which is not making any sense to me. Um, OK, so how do we measure something so tremendously small, this asymmetry, if it exists? And we go to the very first law of precision measurement in physics. If you want to measure something very precisely in physics, try figure out how to change the thing you want to measure into a frequency and measure that. This fits in very nicely after our previous talk. June has just explained to us uh, that you can measure time out to, oh, a part in 10 to the 18. I think in these slides I only claimed a part in 10 to the 15 because I'm conservative. But if you can figure out a way to map the physical quantity you care about onto a frequency or onto a time, you can make a very precise measurement. If you see any quantity measured in physical sciences, chemistry, physics, astronomy, and it has better than about five digits of precision, it's very likely the case that someone figured out a way to convert it into a time. For instance, if you have a voltmeter with six digits on the front of it, it's very likely that they have something that converts voltage into frequency and then measures frequency. It's just a really good way to measure things precisely. Uh, it's really the only way to measure things better to about an apart in a million. So here's an example. Uh, this is actually a very old clock. But amazingly, it's uh, already good to about a part in 10 to the 7, which if you think about it is pretty high accuracy. It just, it just happens to be 11 digits less good than, than June. And the pendulum swings back and forth. You can see I'm very good at animation. And what are we measuring? If you think about it, what we're really measuring is gravity. Gravity pulls down on the pendulum, causes it to swing back and forth. The frequency at which it swings back and forth is proportional to gravity, strictly speaking, the square root of gravity. If we can think about this clock not as measuring time, but as measuring gravity. If we take this clock and put it somewhere where gravity is different, the, the rate of the clock ticking will change proportional to the square root of gravity. And I'm saying, oh, physicists can measure the frequency to a part in 10 to the minus 15. June snorts in derision. Ha, 10 to the minus 15. You know, we did that back when I was you know, in grade school or something. Um, OK, so you could imagine doing the same thing with a magnet. Put a magnet that's allowed to spin around, call it a compass. Put that magnet between two uh, bigger magnets and take it, look at, and, and just pull it to one side, and it's going to go twang and, and jiggle back and forth. If we pull it to one side, it'll want to go back. If we let go, it'll wobble back and forth. We measure the frequency of that wobbling back and forth, and that is proportional to the strength of this magnet. So if we wanted to measure the strength of that magnet very precisely, we could measure the frequency of that wobbling back and forth. Uh, at very, very high precision, perhaps. Uh, looking at the, ra the radio waves coming out, we could measure it to, to uh, much better, you know, part per billion or something. That, of course, is what goes on in something like this. They're measuring, in this case, the little magnets are protons. This is the big magnet. There's little protons inside the patient. The little protons are wiggling back and forth. We detect the radio waves, measure local magnetic fields, which tells us chemical shifts, which tells us about cancer or whatever. I, my understanding is that cancer is, at, at the end of the day, something having to do with chemistry. All right, I've already exhausted my biomedical information. Uh, so there's the proton inside, wobbling back and forth inside the patient's body. Of course, uh, we don't really care about the proton. We care about the electron and it's electric dipole moment. So it's got, uh, yeah, elect the electron does have a north pole and a south pole, but maybe it has these little charges here. Those charges aren't going to care about this magnet. So instead of having a magnet, 
we have sort of like a, a very, we apply a very strong electric field. The big thing next to our electron is not a magnet, but a bunch of, whole bunch of protons, or a whole bunch of positive charge, or a whole bunch of negative charge. We apply a big electric field. If the electron has an electric dipole moment, we tilt it, it'll go twang. Okay, so that's frequency we're trying to measure. In order to do it, because this is, if it, if it exists at all, this electric dipole is so very, very small, to do a better experiment than one that already exists, we have to play, uh, apply a really large electric field. Uh, problem number one, if you apply a large enough voltage here, you just get lightning. Basically, electrons will get, by this positive charge, they'll tear electrons out of the surface. They'll come and smash there and release ions. It'll go back and forth. They'll be discharged. You'll get this huge spark, which will wipe out your sample and probably blow up your electrodes. So that's one problem. The other problem is, the electron in the presence of a big electric field, here's more animation. Gosh, I love it when I can do that. Look at that. I'm going to do that again. Yeah. OK. It gets pulled over and crashes into the electrodes if we try and apply a large electric field to it. So how do we solve this problem? Well, I come, I, I'm, I'm technically an AMO physicist, but really the emphasis is on A. I didn't learn a lot of chemistry in high school, but the one thing I learned about it is that inside molecules, in the M in AMO, uh, it's sort of nature's way of creating a very, very strong electric field. So this is sort of my level of chemistry. Sodium is positive. Chlorine is negative. You guys remember this, right? From, you probably took this and remember this, but sodium positive. So, so you can imagine, you probably also learned that molecules are very, very small. And you probably know if you put a positive thing very close to a negative thing, you're going to have a huge electric field inside. And in fact, right in that space between the sodium and the chlorine ion in a sodium chloride molecule is a very large electric field. It happens to be in sodium chloride that all the electrons are paired. There's no unpaired electrons, so it's not perfect for our purposes. But we can use a molecule, other molecules, which have various good features. And I'm not going to go into what they all are. Our particular molecule of choice is hafnium fluoride plus. Hafnium is very positive. Fluorine is negative. There's a large electric field there. And the ele there's unpaired electrons which hover in just the right place to give us, uh, to cause the electron, if it has an electric dipole moment, to wobble, hopefully with as large a frequency as possible, which is really what we're looking for in this experiment. Um, okay. So we need to compare, the f we need to, to look at, measure the frequency really well. If we want to measure time really well, uh, like, say we have two grandfather clocks, and we want to measure, like, which clock is fastest. This one's going tick, tick, tick. This one's going tick, tick, tick. Uh, so we can count for one minute. We, this one will go tick 60 times. That goes tick 60 times. Are those two frequencies the same? Seem to be. Uh, let's do better. Let's count uh, for one hour. This one ticks 3,600 times. That one ticks 3,600 times. <coughs> yep, pretty much the same. Oh, wait a minute. If we're really patient, we'll count for a whole day. This one. Well, if I discover that this one ticks one time more than that, this one is, this one is gaining one second in one day. So if, we're, if we want to compare frequencies really well, you need to be able to compare them for a long time, a long coherence time. So uh, how do we do that? Um, we need to take our molecules and put them in what we call an ion trap. So here is a trap for uh, rabbits. It's not what we use. Uh, we use a, an ion trap. I'm just going to show it schematically here. These are supposed to be cylinders which have alternating positive and negative charges on it. There's electric fields going between them. And they alternate in just such a way as to keep a charged particle sort of confined to an axis that runs along the same direction as these four uh, cylindrical electrodes. We have additional electrodes on the end, which are positively charged. And, and so we have sort of a long cigar-like tube of space. Uh, tube of volume in which the ions are confined. It's an ion trap. And while they're sitting in there, and we can keep them in there for many seconds, which for an ion is a long time, we can do very precise measurements of frequencies. Uh, those tubes are actually, this is actually not a perfectly easy picture to see, but there are, uh, these electrodes are sort of bars. You can see at the top, there, oh, oh boy, what did I do? Come back to me. Okay, here we go. There's bar, here are some bars of uh, gold-covered electrodes here. And uh, more electrodes are, are shaped parabolically so we can collect photons, which is the O in ions, in case you were wondering. OK. And here's the clock ticking. Here's our molecule ticking back and forth. Uh, you can see it's actually ticking not that much faster than a grandfather clock. Grandfather clock ticks at 1 hertz. 
these guys are ticking at about 16 hertz. Uh, if we look at this time here, in, in just about one second, it's ticked uh, just, just under 16 times. All right, what that's a, what's that about? How do we measure that tick? How do we make the electron in the molecule go tick, and how do we listen to the tick? We use lasers. We use a heck of a lot of lasers. Uh, we use all those lasers. We have going on three quarters of a million dollars of lasers or something like that. I, it's better not to add these all up. We've been gradually assembling this experiment over the course of 10 years. A room full of lasers, and way back there in the corner, we have the experiment, which is just a vacuum chamber with the, with the ion trapped inside it. Uh, just comparing our experiment to other experiments, the, the, the so-called cosmic significance of this experiment has not been lost on other, other uh, precision metrologists, other AMO physicists, and the like in, around the world. And there are uh, big, uh, high-powered experiments trying to measure the same thing, trying to beat us to the punch, as it were, in, in around various places around the world. For many years, the, the best measurement came from the uh, uh, Eugene Cummins lab in Berkeley. And he got all the way down to uh, saying, if, if, if the offset exists, the limit is less than 10 to the minus 27 electron centimeters. Uh, the current limit is held by a Harvard-Yale collaboration, the ACME group, who are down to about 10 to the minus 28 uh, centimeters. And that came out just last year. Uh, and we have a measurement, which I'll talk about soon, which is not quite as good as that, but we're hoping to leapfrog over them by and by. And there's experiments, particularly one going on at Penn State, which is very promising as well. And all of these experiments these days, the modern experiments typically use molecules, so not all of them, and they typically have as long a coherence time as they possibly get. One thing that sets us apart from these other experiments is that we use molecules, and we also have a very long coherence time approaching one second. So we can measure frequencies really well. Molecules are good because it's a crackerjack way of applying really big electric fields to electrons or to anything. Uh, OK, I showed that slide already. All right, so what do we do? First thing we need to do is to create these molecules. You can't buy them from you know, allied chemical. You have to create. They're not a particularly stable species. You actually have to create them in the vacuum chamber uh, and then ionize them. How we do that, we create, I, didn't, I don't have a slide for this, hafnium fluoride, we create that by taking a laser and blasting at a chunk of metallic hafnium. Hafnium metal vapor comes off. We flow sulfur hexafluoride over it, and the hafnium greedily steals a fluorine from the sulfur hexafluoride molecule, and it becomes hafnium fluoride, neutral hafnium fluoride. And it floats around, floats down a, a beam line, and it comes into our ion chamber, and there we hit it with a laser. So there's the first laser. Um, it turns out to require a uh, quite about a lot of energy. And then we hit it with a second laser. We go through a resonant state. These two tunable uh, ultraviolet uh, lasers, they're actually doubled um, visible lasers. Um, these are each doubled visible lasers. These two things take us well up and to a state where the hafnium fluoride neutral molecule is not quite ionized. It's actually in a Rydberg level. It has a very, very loosely bound electron. But that very, very loosely bound electron is loosely bound around an ionic core, which has vibration. So we, this, these two steps correspond to exciting this electron into this great big orbit around a vibrating ion core. And then the vibration relaxes, and it goes down into the vibrational ground state. And that electron causes the electron to leave. And because we can access distinct levels here, they can have distinct vibrational and rotational levels. And the ion we create can be in a vibrational and rotational and isotopic state all according to our specification. So we have a relatively pure sample of hafnium fluoride plus 30%. I know it doesn't sound that high, but, that high, but 30% of the ions are in the state that we want. Uh, I'm not going to walk you through the spectroscopy, but we're just sort of confirming that, yeah, a lot of them are in the, you know, the n equal 1 or, n equal, the lowest, or, or lowest but one rotational level. All right, we need to trap it. Here are our electrodes. The electrodes are sort of long, thin, schematically shown here as these sort of scallop-shaped things, these long, thin electrodes, which uh, apply electric fields, which confine the hafnium fluoride plus uh, in the radial direction. We have additional electrodes not shown that confine it axially. We need to apply an, uh, an electric field to sort of bias the molecule and have it point in a given direction. To do that, we actually apply a, a rotating bias field. It has to rotate because if we were to apply a bias field to this molecule, it's being ionic, it would just accelerate along the direction of that, of that bias field. Instead, we cause the bias field 
almost always an important thing to have in precision spectroscopy, some field to define your quantization axis. That axis rotates in time. So before the ion can go anywhere, the electric field is pointing in another direction, and the ion travels around in a circle. The bias field rotates slowly enough that the molecule, molecular axis stays lined up with the bias field, but it rotates fast enough that the center of mass of the molecule doesn't have a chance to go very far before it bends around into a circle. Those frequencies are a few, uh, in some cases, up to about, oh, here we go, rotational micromotion, about 250 kilohertz. Um, rotating bias fields. One advantage of having a rotating bias field is that if you happen to have in your laboratory, and we all have this in our laboratory, some residual magnetic field, say from the Earth or something like that, which ordinarily would give you a Zeeman shift, would shift the frequencies of the states you are trying to study, uh, if you've got this, this, residual bias, this residual magnetic field, if your bias field is, is rotating you know, around you know, 360 degrees many, many times per second, you will average out the effects of any sort of residual magnetic fields in your lab, which is nice. We don't have to have these high-end magnetic shields surrounding our experiment. Uh, it turns out that the best signal for electric dipole moment is not in the ground state. I, if you don't know molecular notation, it doesn't matter. This is the ground energy level of a molecule. We create the molecule, the ion here, and we have to get it up here to what's called the triplet delta state, just, just labels for now. And this transition from here to here is not an allowed laser transition. So we have to do one laser up to an intermediate state and another laser back down to this state. And by adjusting the relative detuning of those, we can, we can transfer the population from here of all the ions that are in this state and transfer them up into this state. Uh, so we do that using uh, two lasers. And it should be noted that molecules are much more complicated than atoms. They have, uh, these are, these correspond to various different electronic levels of the molecule. A given electronic level has various different vibrational levels. Given vibrational levels have very different rotational levels. We want to go from, and various rotational levels have various different hyperfine levels. We want to go from that ground state into a particular level there which we can do by picking the relative frequencies of those two lasers, the, in particular, the difference between the frequencies of those two lasers, one we absorb, one we emit. The difference is the energy we pick up going from here up to here, and we can tune that into a very particular level there. Um, ion traps are sort of, you might think of them as being a hostile environment for precision metrology because by definition, to trap an ion, you can't have a uniform electric field. You have to have electric fields pointing inward, and uh, the shaking electric fields will generate some poorly characterized magnetic fields, and you might think this is a lousy place to try to measure something precisely. But it turns out the particular molecule we use has got these two levels of opposing parity. This is the lowest lying rotational level of a given state. Uh, and they correspond to the molecules being symmetrically aligned and anti-aligned or anti, you know, either a positive or negative combination of the molecules being aligned and anti-aligned with the electric field. We apply a modest electric field of a few volts, and the energy eigenstates become now aligned in this bias field. The molecule is either pointing with or pointing against the electric field. We also apply a small magnetic field, because there's going to be one there anyway, and it might as well be one that we specify. A small magnetic field to break this degeneracy. Then. When we measure these, this energy transition and this energy transition, they, the effects of the magnet, and we take the difference between those, the effects of the magnetic field and of the electric field on the molecule should cancel out. And the only thing that should be left is the internal electric field dotted in to an electric dipole moment of the electron buzzing around in here, if it exists. So we measure two different frequencies, subtract them, all sorts of inhomogeneity and crap subtracts out, leaving us with hopefully something very close to zero. And actually, hopefully, it's not exactly zero. It's the number we're looking for. It allows us to do crazy precise spectroscopy in a kind of dirty environment, which is the ion trap. How do we read out the population? Basically, we need to know, we need to basically drive these tran a transition between this state and that state, and we need to know has it, has it actually gone from here to here? And it, the magnetic fields we apply are so small that this energy difference is only 15 hertz or something like that. So you can't look at the radio waves 
absorbed or emitted as it flips over here. You have to have some other way of characterizing whether it made this transition. The way we do that is with uh, resonant dissociation. Uh, the molecule can uh, absorb, depending on which of these two states it's in, and depending on the detuning of this first uh, photon, it can absorb a photon, and it can absorb a second photon. If it absorbs the first photon, then it can absorb the second photon, which takes the molecule up to a state which dissociates, falls apart. We take the ions in the trap and we dump them out. If it's still hafnium fluoride plus, when we dump them out, they travel relatively slowly and arrive at an ion detector in 30 microseconds. If it's broken up into hafnium plus, a lighter species, and fluorine, when we dump them out, the hafnium ion is a little bit lighter and it arrives on our detector a little bit sooner. So you can see against almost zero background, this blue line here is our detection of ions that happen to be in that state and not that state, or the other way around, depending on which photon we use there. And so to do the spectroscopy, we start off by first initially populating both of these states because they're very close in energy. We optically deplete. We use a photon with a circular polarization to blow those atoms away, those molecules away. Now we only have population there. We apply a pulse, which moves them over here with some particular initial relative quantum phase. We wait some time. That quantum phase evolves with the relative energy between those two states. We apply another pulse, which adds either coherently or incoherently with the population already there. And then the population that we finally detect in, in this state here is going to depend on uh, how much phase has evolved, basically how many times the grandfather clock has ticked while we are sitting here, which typically is about a second. We, the atoms that made the flop over there, we get rid of them with uh, this, the same pulse of laser light. We detect only the ones in this state. Those are the ones we photo dissociate. And uh, we end up measuring this thing which oscillates up and down. Here you can, for this particular experiment, the frequency is such that this is about 20 hertz. It, the probability of finding it oscillates up and down about 20 times as we increase the time between the two pulses from zero up to about 800 milliseconds. So we measure these frequencies very precisely, and we compare them in order to find out whether the electron has an electric dipole moment. I'm going to go ahead and give something away here. We haven't actually measured the electron electric dipole moment yet. We're working on it, and our current measurement is, is not actually as good as our competition at Harvard and Yale. But we're getting there. Um, and I'm just sort of, I'm sort of walking you through how, where we're at so far. Uh, a lot of what matters to us is we'd like these fringes not to decay over time. We'd like to be able to go out to longer and longer times. What limits us is that the ions collide with each other. We'd like to have lots of ions in there at a time so we get lots of signal. But uh, ions bump into each other. The electric field from one ion perturbs the electric field observed by the other ion. It wobbles around in time. It adds a little phase to the per uh, additional random phase. Eventually causes decoherence. But the experiment we really do is we'll you know, study these, these Ramsey fringes between uh, one pair of levels, and then we'll study them between another pair of levels. And depending on whether we're in this state or in this state, these frequencies might be ever so slightly different, and that's really our observable. Um, we do that uh, with the magnetic field pointing up and with the magnetic field pointing down. We do it with the electrons in the state with the molecule aligned upward and the molecule aligned downward. We measure four frequencies, and we combine those four frequencies linearly. And what's left is a measurement of the electric dipole moment. In this particular case, this was, uh, they all come together. And this was just one little chunk of data collected over a few minutes. Just based on that data, we can say the electric dipole moment, if, ex if it exists, is less than 8 times 10 to the minus 27 centimeters. So we collect a whole lot of data like this. This is um, actually collected over several weeks. And you can see sometimes the, the data is quiet and sometimes it's not. When we collected this data, we weren't really trying to make a precise measurement. We were trying to study systematics. So sometimes we would deliberately turn on extra magnetic fields or, or perturb the electric field. A lot of these data uh, were taken as part of, not of a precision measurement effort, but as a characterization of how precise we are. But it's sort of interesting to see that even just doing this in this rather sub non-ideal way, we're able to get down to a limit saying the electron electric dipole, if it exists, the limit is within about a factor of three of the current um, 
of the current best limit, which is done out on the East Coast at some hoity-toity universities we will not name. Uh, we think that we can improve, make var various, various improvements of our experiment and eventually get to a point where we can challenge the existing limit <coughs> um, with a, a reasonable amount of integration. Um, you know, collect 100 hours of data or something like that and be comparable to and better than the existing limit. Uh, these days, we are, we're pretty, feeling pretty good about our sensitivity. Mostly what we care about is the systematic errors. Uh, it's one of my favorite cartoons, this, this guy, SMBC. So here's uh, one of you talking to a reporter. The reporter says, what did the experiment find? She says, either we had a slight measuring error or all of physics is wrong. All of physics is wrong, says the physics scientist. So <laughs> have that as a, a, a lesson. That will probably happen to you if you ever have experience talking to the media about something you're measuring. Um, we'd like to make sure that we're, we, did, we don't make slight measuring errors. <coughs> uh, we do a lot of different things. We uh, deliberately change the direction of the magnetic field, the direction of the electric field, uh, the density of the atoms. And we study and we, we, we in some sense, we, we know that there are some imperfections in our experiment. And we deliberately make the imperfections worse to see what that is. It's, you know, what you might say is what we should just do is take your experiment and make all the imperfections as small as you can. And that's good advice. But once you've done that, you don't really know how well you're doing. So, in addition to trying to make all the imperfections in your experiment as, as small as you can, can, you should take some of them and temporarily make some of them a lot worse. Because when you make them a lot worse, you know it's easy to tell exactly how bad they are. And you can see what effect this size imperfection has. And you can measure that relatively quickly. So this is like the basic, the basic drill of precision measurement is to, is, is most of the time, you're deliberately making things worse, not better. It's actually sort of fun. It's a lot easier to make things worse. So here are experiments where we deliberately, the magnetic field, when, it, when we change sign, it's supposed to change sign perfectly. One gauss this way, one gauss in the plus direction, then one gauss in the minus direction. What if we make it one gauss plus 10 milligauss this way, and then one mouse gauss minus 10 milligauss that way? That will be an imperfection. We call it the non-reversing magnetic field. We can deliberately apply a non-reversing magnetic field and see its effects on various things we measure. I'm not going to walk you through all this, but it's, it just sort of give you a flavor of the sort of things that we're doing. Similar, OK, these are all sorts of things that we're varying temperature and what have you. Uh, I guess this also has to do with studying the effect of rotation, which causes some exotic geometrical shifts in the frequencies, which we're, we pay a lot of attention to, called Berry's phase. Uh, but again, I'm just going to pop through that. We actually, it's actually something which we understand. And the universal symbol for we understand it is a theory line going through most of your points. Uh, well, actually, that's, I lied. Because here we have uh, lines going through most of our points. In this particular case, we, we deliberately applied an, a magnetic field in the transverse direction and deliberately moved the ions a little bit off the center of the trap in that direction. And we saw some large shifts in the frequencies we measured. And we fit them, but these are just fit with polynomials. We, we don't understand where these shifts are coming from. We don't see the shifts appear in the final value when we can combine all our data and, and add it and subtract it in the right way. But since we don't understand why it appears at all, we're uneasy about it. And it's just, I'm showing it just because to tell you we don't understand everything yet. This is the th sort of problem we're, we're, we're thinking about right now is, what is the effect of a transverse field coupled with a deliberate offset in that direction? Something we don't understand. All right. Um, this is an instructive plot that my student, Matt Grau, found from an, an old paper. Uh, it's hard to see here, but this is the um, zero on this axis is the current uh, corresponds to uh, like the current best value for Avogadro's number, and, uh, which came from a measurement in the, uh, in the 1970s. And here shows the best measurement that was made in 1950. 1950, the best measure of 1955, 1960, 1965. The interesting thing about that is that all these different measurements made by different groups aren't oscillating back and forth about the best value and getting closer and closer. They're tending to follow a trend. This measurement was made. This measurement was made. The next people said, well, we actually think it's lower than that. But they didn't possibly didn't have quite the courage to say it's all over. You know, 
the, it, it, this is some evidence that this measurement or this measurement might have been influenced by that measurement. Uh, the fact that they're heading down towards the right number but can't quite get there. They're not bouncing back and forth. So that's Avogadro's number. Similar things happen when people try to measure the mass of the electron, the value of Planck's constant. You often see this kind of effect. It's just a natural psychological trend tendency. It's not because people are being dishonest. It's that they just can't quite bring themselves to believe that the existing is our value is that wrong. And so they'll m make a step in the right direction, but they're very much influenced by what they already know. The, this happens, uh, has happened enough times that most modern precision metrologists blind their data. Basically, when they're taking their most accurate data, they don't look at the number. Because we have computers these days, you can instruct the computer analyze the data and, and add a small random number to it. And you don't know what that random number is. And then you do all your analysis. You try to understand what your error bars are. And at the very end, you tell the computer, take away the random number and tell me the answer. But by that time, you, you and your collaborators and everyone, you've all agreed that no matter what the answer is, we're going to publish it. Even if you know, all the numbers are up here and our number is over here, we're going to publish it because we can believe in it. It's basically a way of trying to get away, of this, get away from this kind of bias of you think you know what the right answer is. Anyway, we're doing that. We're blinding our data. Uh, and uh, OK. So uh, we think that sometime in the next couple of years, we'll be able to make a measurement which is quite a bit better than the existing limit, and not coincidentally, because this is why we're doing the experiment, at a level of accuracy, which is good enough that uh, if we see something, it's, it's very, very relevant to this grand the theoretical enterprise out there, which is trying to figure out why do we exist? Why was there this initial asymmetry after the Big Bang? Why are there more matter than antimatter? And with that, I'm going to stop and take questions. And thank you for your attention. <laughs> How did I do for time? Pretty good. Yeah, the, after we measure them, they get optically pumped into some state where we don't have lasers to see them again. And the time it takes for them to spontaneously decay back to the ground state is really long, because these are near ground state. So yeah, we make a fresh batch of molecules every time. The time it takes to zap it, make the vapor, turn on the, turn on the little puff of gas, turn off the puff of gas, let them float down there and ionize them. That all takes about 50 milliseconds. And then we do about 800 milliseconds of measurement. And then we dump out the trap and cycle back through. So the vast majority of our time is spent between the two pulses of the Ramsey spectroscopy. So you know, most of the time is, if you actually look 70% of the time, we're actually, the ions are actually in there going tick, 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 tick. But there's sort of 30% of dead time necessary to pre prepare a new sample. Yeah. I'm sorry, was Yes. They're doing, uh, many things are the same. They're using a molecule. Uh, they're using this technique, which actually we borrowed from one of the people involved in the Harvard-Yale group years ago came up with this idea of this, what's called the omega-1 state. So that's an idea which they're using also. Uh, but I would say generically, their experiment is a much more traditional molecular